Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel Record of Mark. The Gospel Record of Mark and chapter number 5. The Gospel Record of Mark and chapter number 5. We're continuing with our series of the gospel record of Mark, walking with Jesus Christ through his earthly ministry. And as we walk through here, we understand that the gospel record of Mark is the gospel record of action. It is just continual action of Jesus taking care of this, and Jesus doing this, and Jesus working. We know that in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, according to the gospel record of John, that Jesus did so many acts and so many teachings that if you were to take all of them and try to put them in a book, there wouldn't be enough volumes to contain everything that he did. So what the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit did through the inspiration of Scripture is that God only chose 35 major miracles to record within the gospel records. And that each one of these miracles that are lifted out, that are pointed out, are there for a purpose, there to teach a lesson, there to draw us closer to Jesus Christ and know whom he is. And as we talked through the gospel record of Mark chapter 5 today, we're going to see another one of these miracles. And through this miracle, we could see a little bit more about what Jesus is doing and what he wants to teach us. And so if you don't mind, let's look together in the gospel record of Mark chapter number 5. The gospel record of Mark chapter 5, and notice with me in verse number 21. The gospel record of Mark chapter 5 and verse 21. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. And when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment." For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be made whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague." While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado, and weep? The the damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. 
But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talimuth Kumai, which being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightway that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. And if they happen to mark things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that Jesus Christ speaks to Jairus when he hears the worst news of his life. The phrase in verse uh, Mark chapter 5 and verse 36. Mark 5 verse 36. The phrase, be not afraid, only believe. Be not afraid, only believe. And with the Lord's help, we'd love to encourage you with that same message here. Be not afraid, only believe believe. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And I thank you for the, you being a miracle working God, a God who could do so much more than we could think or ask or do or see that you're a God who sees the end from the beginning. Your ways are above our ways. Your thoughts are much higher than our thoughts. You know exactly what you're doing. That we have to throw ourselves at your mercy and just say, God, we need you. We're dependent upon you. Help us to learn to trust you by faith and live a life of faith and not of fear. I'm asking that you would just help someone today that is troubled. Help someone today that is worried. Help someone today that is anxious. Help someone today that has a legitimate thing in their life and help them to rely on you by faith and believe knowing that you are God and that there is none else. Help us as we communicate this story that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, that you could give me exactly the words to say, that you would be with those words, and that you could speak to hearts no matter where they are. Thank you that we could trust you and depend upon you now. We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we've already covered part of this story last time, but this the last time that we spoke, this pays a big part in the whole, as we see this man by the name of Jarius, the first thing I'd like to bring to your attention is a man in desperation. A man in desperation. In Mark chapter 5, in the earlier parts of this, we dealt with the maniac of Gadara. And if you can remember, the maniac of Gadara was someone who was living in the tombs. He was screaming and cutting himself. He was in chains. He was in torments. But he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And next thing you know, he was sitting clothed and his right mind. Now the people did not know how to respond to this. And so they did something, what we would look and say crazy. They kicked Jesus out of the country. They asked him to leave. Get out of here. We don't know what to do with you. We don't know who you are. Get out of here. But now we could see Jesus on the return trip. He's coming coming back to the exact spot where he dealt with the maniac of Gadara. And here, instead of the people getting rid of Jesus Christ... Now there's a big crowd that all want to see him. Notice with me in verse number 21. Mark chapter 5 and verse 21. And when Jesus passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him and he was nigh unto the sea. This carries the idea that as soon as he gets off the boat, everyone's immediately rushing towards him. For those of you who don't like crowds, can you imagine what it would be like to be Jesus Christ? That as soon as he gets lands, there's a huge crowd and he starts to get off the boat and they all swarm him. They're all there. They want to see Jesus. They all want to touch him. They all want to talk to him. They all want to interact with him. He is there. Uh, Talk about claustrophobia in the midst of a crowd. They're just pressing on him. But in here, there's one individual that the Lord pays attention to through the annals of scripture, verse number 22. And behold, 
There cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. So here's Jarius. Jarius is a ruler of the synagogue, meaning that he was one of the people in charge of the local teaching center, the local Bible teaching center, the synagogue where people would gather to learn the word of God, to uh, gather to um, learn more about what God has for them. This is a man who runs or is a ruler. He's in charge of one of these synagogues. Now at this time, many people who are religious, Pharisees, uh, scribes, the Sadducees, are already turning against Jesus. And Jairus knew this. But there's something about being desperate that you don't care about what other people say. You need Jesus. And so when he hears that Jesus has come to the coast, now he's got a problem. We'll give you a sneak peek. His daughter is dying. And she is very close to death. Could you imagine, if you wouldn't mind, thinking about Jairus, he's been dealing with his daughter, and he hears that Jesus was on the coast. But then the people chased him away. Just the time he needs him, his daughter is sick. Hey, Jesus is here. That's great. Hey, let's go find him. Oh, wait, never mind. They just chased him away. Could you imagine how frustrated that would be to hear that Jesus was there, but the people kicked him off? They were afraid of him and they chased him away. What a heartbreak that would be. Oh, but good news happened. Jesus has come back. Jesus is on the, coming back from the other side. He's now landing. Jarius immediately said, take care of things. I am going to go get Jesus. So he runs down to the shore himself. And he scoots past the press of people. He gets by them. He falls down at the feet of Jesus and begins to beg him. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse 23. And besought him greatly. This carries the idea of begging. He's earnestly begging, Lord, please, I need you. He besought him greatly, saying, My little, da- my little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Now, when he's talking about that she's at the point of death, he is not exaggerating. She is not going to die in a couple years. She is not going to die in a couple of weeks. She is at the moment of death right now. And the only way to pry a, a loving father away from a dying girl is for hope. He went to go get someone who could do something about it. And he left his daughter. His heart is there. And he's saying, my daughter is dying right now. Please come. And so there's no time to waste. He knows that she is moments from death. He doesn't have hours. He doesn't have time for Jesus to do a whole religious service. He doesn't have time for Jesus to go and pack his bags. He needs Jesus right now. Now, it is a desperate time. And he's fallen at Jesus' feet. Please come heal my daughter. Please come take care of her. Verse number 24. And Jesus went with him. And much people followed him and thronged him. So here's Jairus. Trying to get Jesus to his daughter. But there's some obstacles that pop in his way. Here is a desperate man. I want you to place yourself into Jarius' mind. In Jarius' way of thinking. His daughter is moments from death. He has finally got Jesus. I'm glad that those people didn't chase away Jesus for good. I'm glad he came back. Jesus is here. Now he's only got moments. The time is going off. You could imagine. I've got a weird imagination. I could almost imagine this scene almost cartoon-like with a clock that's counting down in the corner and Jarius keeps looking at the clock. How much time do I have left? It's running out. With It's that type of desperation. He's racing against the clock. And he takes Jesus, I can, in using my imagination, he's taking Jesus by the hand and he's pulling, dragging Jesus, but he's going against the crowd. It's like a Black Friday sale crowd where everyone's trying to get the very best electronics that's already raised up in price and the discounted so it looks cheaper. And everyone wants to get that thing. And everyone's fighting against it and they're pushing and shoving. And he's trying to pull against 
the crowd. The crowd is going one way. Jairus is going the other. And he's trying to get Jesus through here. Now, I don't know about you, but his patience was probably not the best. You could imagine Jarius maybe sh shooting a little elbow every now and again. He's trying to fight the crowd out, clear them off. He's not sitting there still. He's animated. Get out of my way. Don't move. Get. Why are you pushing? I'm trying to get through. He's trying to let the crowd know how important this is to him. His frustration is building. He has the hope for his daughter in his hand, but the clock is is running out. That desperation is rising. There is no time to waste. Come on. I need you now Jesus. No. Don't talk to him. Let's go. Come on. But yet everyone wants to see Jesus. You know at this time Jarius does not care about anyone else. He doesn't care that anyone else has problems. He doesn't care that anyone else is sick. He doesn't care about anything else that someone is facing. All that he is concerned about is that his daughter has a need and he has the answer in his hand and he has to get the answer to his daughter and everything is in the way. His desperation is rising. So we start with a man in desperation, but then we come to a miraculous interruption, a miraculous interruption. Jarius is pulling Jesus and he's trying to get to the crowd. He doesn't care about what's going on, but there's something going on in the background. We have our attention moving from Jarius, who's on one side of Jesus, to a woman who's on the other side of Jesus. Notice with me in verse 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but grew worse. Here is a lady, for 12 years she's been sick. For 12 years she's had an ailment. For 12 years she's gone to every doctor she could find, every witch doctor, every... Uh, homeopathic person every wives tale she's tried it all and has not improved but grown worse she is a woman who's desperate in her own might now Jarius was a ruler of a synagogue he could walk straight up to Jesus and said Jesus I need you come with me and he's dragging Jesus away this woman did not want to be noticed but she figured in her mind verse number 28 uh, 27 when she heard that Jesus came, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. So she says, if I could just sneak behind Jesus. If I could just get through the crowd unnoticed. And you could see her. Jarius is standing tall. And pushing Jesus. And pushing people away. But here's a lady who's trying to not to be seen at all. She's making herself small. She's hunching over. And if I could just touch him, she's reaching out past the crowd. If I could just touch the hem of his garment. If I could just touch the fringe. If I could just touch the edge. If I could just touch Jesus. It's all I need. I don't need his attention. I just need to touch Jesus. I need Jesus. And as soon as she touched Jesus straightway immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up can you imagine having 12 years of the same affliction at one moment go away that would feel different to be sick for 12 years and then all of a sudden feel better straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague and Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out, turned him about the press and said, Who touched my clothes? Now let's go back to Jairus' perspective. We talked about the lady last time we met. But here's Jairus. He's already fighting against the crowd. Move out of the way. Stop it. Get out of the way. He's got Jesus in one hand and he's elbowing and fighting and forcing himself through the crowd. And all of a sudden as he's pulling Jesus, Jesus stops and stiffens up. And Jesus isn't going anymore. Come on. Do you think Jarius is happy with this interruption? Do you think he wants the procession to stop? 
but Jesus isn't going anymore and you're not going to push Jesus if he doesn't want to go. Jesus stops and then Jesus turns around. That's the opposite direction. We need to go this way. Can you, as you pan this out in your mind's eye, can you see the face of Darius? Is it happy? Is it peaceful? Is he content? This is nice. You could see that frustration on his face. Why? Stop. And Jesus turns around and begins to address the crowd. Who touched me? Who touched my clothes? And no one answered. No one's moving. The disciples start saying, everyone's touching you. What do you mean who touched me? Everyone's touching you. And the disciples begin to talk and Jairus, all right, no one's fessing up. Let's go. Come on. It doesn't matter. But Jesus isn't going anywhere, and he just stands looking. He already knew who did it. Uh, the gospel record of Matthew spends time saying that he waited until the lady saw that Jesus wasn't going to move anymore. Then finally she steps out. Notice with me, if you don't mind, verse 32. And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done to her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. So here's this lady. She's nervous. She's got caught. Jesus stopped. And she doesn't want any attention. And she tried to be quiet, hoping that he would just turn around and pass. By the way, at this moment, Jairus and the woman wanted the same thing. They both wanted Jesus to keep going. But no, Jesus stopped Wouldn't go anywhere until the woman finally confessed. So this woman steps out. She's afraid, trembling, probably has lost her voice and is figuring out what am I going to say? What am I going to do? And she begins to stutter and begin to explain. And the Bible says, begin to tell him all the truth. So she probably started off with who she is, where she's from, this disease that happened. And she went to this doctor and went to this doctor and she's tried this and went through her history. Do you think Jarius cares about her medical history right now? Shut up. Come on. Let's go. Come on. She's fine. Let's go. I mean, he was probably nicer than that. But if he was anything like us, that's what was going on inside of his mind, his heart. Let's go. Come on. Not, uh, and the, he, Jesus deals patiently with this woman and tells her that because of her faith, notice this, verse 34. And he said unto her, daughter, thy faith had made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now this is an important idea. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Now Jarius I do not know, but he's probably half listening. How do I know that? Because when people are frustrated, they half listen. Jesus is giving a message to Jairus as well as this lady. He says, thy faith had made thee whole. So when he's half listening, he says, all right, I got my faith here. Let's go. But Jesus is trying to teach him something else. Of trusting in God's timing. Trusting that God knows what he's doing. Do you live your life by force? Or do you live your life by faith? He's trying to force things to work. He's trying to force. I mean you say how is this a bad thing? He's trying to force Jesus to heal his daughter. He's trying to force the situation. He's working on his timing. And not Jesus' timing. Jesus says I've got things well in hand. I'm not worried about your daughter. And Jairus says, why aren't you worried about my daughter? She's dying. Have you ever found yourself trying to get Jesus concerned for something that you are concerned over? You ever talked about Jesus and be honest, say, Jesus, how come this isn't bothering you like it's bothering me? This is important. Jesus, I have things well in hand. My timing's perfect. I already know how I'm going to solve this. No, you've got to take care of this now. It has to be solved now, now, now. I'm sure that you probably never had a fit like that to Jesus, but I can imagine Jarius right now saying, now, 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 I've got the answer in my hand. Let's go. Let's get Jesus to him. We see this miraculous interruption. But then we see something else. The master at work. 
the master at work. Verse 35. And while he, Jesus, yet spoke, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why trouble thou the master any further? So, as this lady has stopped and taking all this time to tell her life story, his daughter died. Probably the first thing that's running through his mind when he says his daughter's died, don't bother the master anymore, is like, I was just there. I was so close. This isn't fair. This isn't right. It's too late. Why was it Jesus on time? Why did we have to have this interruption? Do you think he's happy that this lady got healed? This lady had a miraculous thing happen. And he can't enjoy the healing of someone else because he is concerned with his own problem. And by the way, it's a big problem. But he was not happy. In fact, do you think that he was pretty resentful that this lady took the time to get healed? He was not happy that this other lady was happy. He was not happy that someone got healed. He was not happy that Jesus is taking time to teach now. Let's go. And now it's too late. If it wasn't for that lady, if it wasn't for the crowd, if it wasn't for this, if it wasn't for this. And all he's saying is all of his frustrations. But notice what Jesus responded to this man. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. This is what Jesus answers him. Be not afraid, only believe. This man just had his worst fear come true. Be not afraid, Only believe. Just a moment before, he just said, thy faith had made thee whole. Faith and believe. It is amazing to see how God uses this idea and when he tells people to believe. You might remember, it's coming up later in Mark chapter 9. The man who went to the disciples and the disciples couldn't cast out the demon of his son. You know what Jesus told him? He said, believe. But it didn't work before. Believe. But I tried. Believe. Jarius right now. He said I trusted in you. And it didn't work. At the point where Jarius is looking at. In his own eyes. Doesn't it look like. What he trusted in did not work. It failed. He went to Jesus. And it didn't happen on time. His daughter died. And yet Jesus has the audacity to look at him and say, be not afraid, only believe. Believe in what? She's dead. It's over with. But God is never late. He may not work in our time schedule, but God is always on time. The book of Psalms says this, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. May I also put this supposition here? Not only are the steps of a good man ordered by the Lord, but so are his stops. The stops of a good man are ordered by the Lord. There are times that God in our desperation causes us to wait. In our desperation, that is the last thing we want to do is to wait. But you know that waiting is the ultimate form of worship? That means you trusting God. And God will often make us wait when we're at the height of our desperation. I need you, God. I need you to work. And God says, I've got things well in hand. Do you trust me? My daughter just died. Do you trust me? That's a hard thing to swallow. It passed. My deadline passed. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Be not afraid. Only believe. Verse 37. And he suffered, or he didn't allow, no man to follow him save Peter and James and John. 
the brother of James. So Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and they go with Jairus to the woman's house. Verse 38. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult. This idea of tumult means out of order. It is the people are weeping and wailing. Notice the rest of the verse. And them that wept and wailed greatly. Now we can understand weeping. But the wailing carries the idea of carrying on a morning noise. Not in the morning, but morning as is I'm sad because someone died. They are so upset they have no hope. My daughter just died. Now, we can understand. We're not criticizing them for missing their daughter. If your daughter just died of traumatic sickness, an accident, don't you think you should be upset? It's natural to be upset. They're weeping and they're wailing and they're carrying on and they're making a big noise. They can hear the cries and the screams and the moans from outside the house. The Bible says there's a great tumult. It's a great noise. It is hard to talk when the people are wailing and so upset and screaming and crying. And why? Why? Verse number 39, and when he, that's Jesus, was come in, he saith to them, why make ye this ado? Why are you carrying on like this? You say, that sounds kind of heartless. They just lost their daughter and they're weeping and wailing. He says, why are you making all this noise? Why are you making this a big ado? Why are you weeping? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Now, imagine you know what dead is. Dead is dead. I don't know how many dead bodies that you look at, but they're easily recognizable as dead. They're, the blood stops flowing. Their skin turns pale, gray, and ashen. You could look at him and say, he is dead. Especially since it's, it's been a couple of minutes before they got there. there. The body is lifeless. It is limp. It is not responding. It is there. It is clear. And yet Jesus says she's only sleeping but dead. Now uh, hurting people hurt people. Are these people hurt? Absolutely. And when hurting people hurt. They don't want to hear this. She's just. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. What? Wait, you don't know what a dead... Look, that is dead. That is dead, dead. Look at her. She is dead. You can't tell what dead is? You want to tell me my daughter's not dead? I mean, how do you process that information? Think of Jairus now. He went and found the answer. He went to Jesus like he was supposed to. But Jesus was late. So many interruptions. So many things. He couldn't get Jesus in time. He brings Jesus in the house. His wife's wailing. The servants are wailing. He begins to cry himself. The tears are flowing. They're all hugging. He goes and hugs his wife. And they just sob uncontrollably. And Jesus says, why are you making this a big ado? She's not dead. She's sleeping. What? What do you mean? Verse number 40. But they laughed him to scorn. They turned around and they tore into Jesus. Hurting people hurt people. What do you mean? Can't you tell what dead is? You come in here in our house and you tell us a daughter's not dead. If you would have been here on time, this wouldn't have happened. They're upset and they laughed him to scorn. Uh, this, it, it's only a sentence here, but this was a period here where the wife, you can almost imagine her get upset and start lunging at Jesus. Can you imagine someone lunging at Jesus? And the husband holding her back. And she is just upset. She's ready to tear into him. And she's saying things. We know that people can get emotional. When you get emotional, you're not saying nice things. Jesus didn't come here to be insulted. But they're yelling at Jesus. Have you ever seen someone mad at Jesus? Maybe that was something that you think is little. Maybe it was something that was big. How dare you let my 107-year-old grandmother die? I don't understand why you would let her die. And we may look at that and say, but she was 107. But pain is still real. And sometimes when people are hurting, they say things that that death happens. God's not going to let grandma live forever. 
But yet they blame Jesus and they're upset. Here's a lady, you can imagine she's upset at Jesus. Why? It's your fault my daughter died. You were supposed to kill this. And now you want to say she's not dead? You want to come into my house? I mean, this is a mess. For those of you who thought that Jesus' ministry was always easy, it was not. He had to deal with hurting people. Verse number 40, And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, <laughs> I would too. All right, I'm going to take care of the daughter, but all of you out. Out. By the way, in the gospel record of Matthew, it seemed to indicate that his disciples were part of this mess too. Everybody out. Out. But when he had put them out and taken the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him, Peter, James, and John, <laughs> he kicked them all out. And entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Tab, uh, Tathema Kumai, which is being interpreted damsel, I say unto thee. That Tabitha Kumai actually carries the idea of little lamb. It's an affectionate term. It is something, my precious little lamb. This little damsel come up. He's saying this, this girl is precious to me. She's one of my precious little lambs. My precious little girl. I care for her. And that is a true statement. Jesus did care for her. As much as the parents wanted it to accuse her, accuse Jesus of not caring, he did care. And he grabbed her by the hand. He said, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked. For she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished. With great astonishment. The word astonishment carries the idea of wow, marveling, of, of awe. And Jesus said, damsel arise. Picks her up by the hand and says, hey, there's some people that want to see you. And she could just look up and say, really? And he takes her out side of her room. And there's the mother and father. They still have emotions, but now that roller coaster is going on. Desperation leading up. You reach that point where it falls off the edge and it all collapses down. But then you see her again. Their hearts are leaping. What? What just happened? What? what? And they're just, they don't have any words to say. I mean, this is an emotional roller coaster for that entire family. Emotions are going up and down. But now they see their daughter and they, they're just, they don't know what to say. They don't know how to explain it. The, the emotions are all tangled. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that they bring her something to eat. Now let's cover this last part first. And commanded to bring her something to eat. Why is this important? Why is this in scripture? Well, it was proof that she was made whole. She was sick and then she died. But to prove that she is restored wholly, she was able to eat. She is no longer sick and she is alive. This is the proof. But then Jesus said this, that no man should know it, that it should be commanded. <clears throat> Why doesn't he want Jesus, anyone to know? This is a great miracle. Don't you think that everyone should know? Well, there's, this is out of practicality. First of all, so no one keeps bothering the girl. Hey, I heard you were dead. What was it like? Could you imagine everyone who wants to talk to her now? Let's give her some peace. Let's not advertise this. Let's just leave it alone. Second of all, another practicality is that Jesus did not need everyone going to the graveyard to go pick up grandma who's been dead for 20 years and say, Jesus, can you raise grandma? He had enough stuff to do. He didn't need people to go into the graveyard to go pick up their favorite pet or their favorite person and bring them back. Hey, this guy's been dead 100 years. Can you raise him? What limits do you have? So there was a practicality, but let's not tell people about this. Let's not advertise this. Keep it quiet for your daughter's sake so that way she's not being hounded. It's going to be fine. But we go back to the statement that he told him at the beginning. Be not afraid, only believe. Here's a man who was in desperation. And in his desperation, he went to Jesus. That was the right thing to do. But things kept getting in the way. Miraculous interruptions. Was those things from God? Absolutely. 
You see what happened because God's timing is perfect? It is a great miracle for someone to be healed from a sickness. But there is a greater miracle for someone to be raised from the dead. Here's a family that got to experience that greater miracle because God's timing was perfect. God knew what he was doing the whole time. And even when the worst news happened that it all failed, Jesus still said, be not afraid, only believe. That message still holds true today. Be not afraid, only believe. You say, have you seen what's going on in our country right now? Have you been living under a rock? Isn't there some horrible things going on? Absolutely. There are some very disconcerting things. But my faith is not in the governor. My faith is not in the government. My faith is not in the doctors. My faith is in Jesus. Be not afraid, only believe. But you don't understand what the people are doing to ruin our country. My faith is not in them. My faith is in Jesus. Be not afraid, only believe. But do you understand there are some real people who are getting real sick? And some of them are dying. Yes, be not afraid, only believe. But what happens when you get it? Be not afraid, only believe. But what happens if your daughters get it? Be not afraid, only only believe. What happens if you lose all the money? What happens when the job doesn't pay the bills and all the stuff? Be not afraid, only believe. We don't have to live in a state of fear. And that could be the true categorization of description of our nation right now is fear. People are responding from fear from different sources. Some are afraid of getting sick. Some are afraid of the government. Some are afraid of the response. Some are afraid of the economics. Some are afraid of things that are going to change. We live in a state of fear and people's response of fear. But the message is still the same. Be not afraid. Only believe. You said, but I've been praying and it still hasn't been cleared up. It's because God works off his timing, not ours. His timing is perfect. He wants to see if we're willing to wait on him, to trust him, to look towards him. And the message that we have for others, let's say that you say, I am trusting in God and I am depending on him. Then we need to tell others that they can trust in God. Not to be afraid, but only believe. There's a God who's in control. We have a God who's not pacing the throne room of heaven, saying, what am I going to do? How's this going to fix? I didn't see this coming. He's not rubbing his head on his hand and saying, oh man, this is giving me a headache. I don't know all these people here. He's not wringing his hands nervously saying, I don't know. I don't know. He is sitting on the throne. He is not writing Facebook post. By the way, he's not asking you to share Facebook post. But he knows exactly what he is doing. And our response to a God who is sitting on the throne is not to be afraid, only believe. That is the message we need to put in our hearts today. Because we are fearful people. And there are legitimate things to be concerned for. But our faith is in a God who's in control. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus. And I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you could give us a call at area code 920 920- 
920-530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you. Thank you.